Hello friends, welcome to Smart Catalyst. Today we'll be seeing the current affairs of 6 February 2019. The articles we'll be seeing for prelims are these seven. First article is about the bullet train project and its conflict with national parks in the state of Maharashtra. The second article is about voter verifiable paper audit trials for Lok Sabha polls. Third article talks about the rise in government subsidy. And the fourth one is about new missile systems developed by the country of Russia by the year 2021. The fifth article will be dealing talks about growth divergence between states and convergence at the district level, which is a World Bank report. Sixth article talks about the fresh NPAs in the coming year. And the final one talks about the classification of farmers. The first article for the day is Bullet Train Gets Green Light via Flamingo Haven National Park. This article was taken from the paper Hindu. This article talks about the conflict between economic development on one hand and the environment conservation on the other. So this article talks about the recent clearance given by Environment Ministry for a bullet train project from Ahmedabad in the state of Gujarat to Mumbai in Maharashtra. This bullet train project is largely funded by soft loans from the country of Japan. However, the problem here is, though this helps in infrastructural development and connectivity, this project encroaches upon Flamingo Sanctuary in Thane, as well as Sanjay Gandhi National Park, which is a home to leopards, and Tungareshwar Wildlife Sanctuary in the state of Maharashtra. We all know that wildlife clearance is a critical part of forest clearance process. This clearance, which is given by the Environment Ministry, the decision for this clearance, which is finally given by the Environment Ministry, first goes to the apex body called as National Board for Wildlife. This apex body, that is NBW, is tasked with giving permissions to allow the conversion of forest land for non-forest purposes, especially for the purpose of industrial development. Here also, National Board of Wildlife has played a critical role. It has laid some preconditions for this bullet train project from Ahmedabad to Mumbai. The conditions laid by it are paying fund of 2% of total project cost, barricading the work site to ensure that there is no fall of debris on the project area which may affect the wildlife in that area, providing funds for uh, creating plantation at least five times the number of mangroves which will be lost due to the construction of this project. However, we all know that from the past experiences, the implementation of these preconditions uh, are very minuscule. The second article talks about 100% use of VVPAT for Lok Sabha polls. Election Commission. This article talks about increasing transparency with the use of VVPAT for the Lok Sabha elections this year. This talks about voter verifiable paper audit trials. The Election Commission on Tuesday, it informed Madras High Court that there will be 100% usage of voter verifiable paper audit trial system for the Lok Sabha election this year. This is in response to a bill filed by NGO. So here for the prelims, we have to know about VVPAT system. We all know that India moved from paper ballots to EVMs almost two decades ago and however many institutions have repeatedly questioned validity and authenticity of these EVMs. In order to bring in more transparency into the working of the election system in our country, now the election commission is implementing this VVPAT system. So for the prelims we have to know what this system is. So currently the EVMs in our country, they display only the total number and also the total vote secured by each and every candidate standing in that particular constituency. However, with the implementation of VVPAT, when a vote is cast by an individual, there will be a slip visible for the individual say for up to 10 seconds showing the name of the candidate for whom he voted, voter serial number as well as the poll symbol. Apart from this, a voter can see the printout but not take it out. So he can verify this vote. So one can verify whether the vote is registered correctly or not. So more transparency will be induced into the system by verifying this VVPAT results with the EVM results. So thus we are the method of uh, feedback. This independent verification process will allow the voter to verify if the vote has gone to the intended candidate. The third article we'll be seeing is about the government subsidy. Government subsidy spent on rice again. This article was taken from the newspaper Hindu. So this article talks about the increase in government spending via subsidy and this data is taken from the budget documents released a few days back. So if you see the infographics here, the total subsidies as a proportion to the total expenditure has considerably increased from 2012 to 2019. However, in the year 2019 and 2020, the budget estimates forecast increase in the subsidies as a proportion to expenditure. This is because of the new schemes which are proposed to be implemented by the center such as PM Kisan and other scheme called Shramyogi Yojana for an unorganized sector. 
However, this increase is only a marginal increase. In the year 1819, it's 9.6 percentage. Now, it's expected to increase by about 0.2 percentage. However, if you come down to the individual subsidies, namely food subsidy and petroleum subsidy, you can see the changes here. The food subsidy has peaked in the year 2018 and 2019. The main reason for this peak is increase the MSP allocation to the individual farmers. The government of India last year announced 1.5 times MSP to all the farmers in order to attain doubling the farmers income by 2022. And this is a major reason for the spike in food subsidy to about 70 percentage last year. The second one is petroleum subsidy. The, the petroleum subsidy has been considerably low for past few years. However, in the year 2019 and 2022, it is projected to increase to about 60 percentage. The main reason for this is centers focus on LPG and other cleaner forms of fuels to its citizens. There's increased allocation to this LPG via the scheme of direct benefit transfer. So the government is implementing this DBT scheme for LPG via a scheme called as PAHAL under Ministry of Petroleum and Natural Gases. Apart from this, there is also another scheme called as Ujwala scheme, which aims to provide new LPG connections to the rural areas. This scheme is also one of the main reasons for the spike in the petroleum subsidy in the coming fiscal. It is to be noted that the LPG consumption was low at about 1.6% in 2012. It has increased to about 9% currently with the launch of these two schemes for LPG and other cleaner fuels. The fourth article for the day is Russia to develop new missile systems by the year 2021. This article talks about the treaties with respect to nuclear weapons between the state of USA and Russia such as SALT and START. This article talks about Russia's plan to develop new land-based and long-range hypersonic missile system by 2021. So we all know that recently both Russia as well as United States of America, they withdrew from Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Agreement, which was signed in the year 1987. So in this line, for the prelims, you have to know about the INS Treaty and the associated other treaties such as SALT and START. First, let's start with INF. So this INF stands for Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Agreement. This was signed between Russia and USA in the year 1987. This treaty between United States of America and Russia, it plans to eliminate all ground-launched cruise missiles of range 500 to 5000 kilometers. It came into force in the year 1988 and both the sides, they completed their reduction by the year 1991. This INF treaty deals with only ground launched cruise missiles and it does not talk about the missiles that are launched from air or sea. So in this line, there are other treaties negotiated between USA and USSR to limit the nuclear stockpile between both the superpowers. The first of them is SALT. So this SALT stands for Strategic Arms Limitation Talks. It, the parties began negotiation in the year 1969 and finally it was signed in the year 1972. One of the important purpose of SALT is it has produced another treaty called as Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty that is ABM. This ABM treaty it bans the number of intercontinental ballistic missiles and submarine launched ballistic missiles. However, in the year 2002, USA it unilaterally withdrew from the ABL treaty. This SALT-1 treaty, which was signed in the year 1991, it aims both the countries to reduce the deployed strategic arsenals by the specified category by the year 2001. After SALT-1, there was new agreement called as New START. This agreement, which was signed in the year 2010, it limits both the countries' strategic arsenals to 1550 warheads and it also limited the number of launches to 800. This agreement came into force in the year 2011 and it is valid till 2021. So since both the parties have withdrawn from INF, the renewal of this new START agreement is a big question mark. The next article we will be seeing is, growth diverges between states but converges at the district level. This article was taken from the paper mint and this article is based on a recent paper released by World Bank. So in a recently released paper by World Bank, it says that the growth diverges between states, however, it converges at the district level. We all know that there is clear distinction between the rich and the poorer states in our country and the growth levels associated with them. And in India, this rich and poor states divide also coincides between north and south divide with more southern states being developed and more north Indian states, especially the Bimaru states, 
being highly underdeveloped. This World Bank paper based on the data collected from National Sample Survey rounds 2004-05 and 2011-12 and Living standards has exemplified differences in the living standard between the rich states of southern India and the poor states in Bimaru region. This study states that the strong drivers of growth in the states of India include market access, availability of electricity, as well as connectivity. Though economic factors play a major role, the role of social factors is also very much important for determining the growth of these states. These social factors include education, health, reducing gender gaps as well as greater social homogeneity. The next article is banks may see fresh non-performing assets of up to 2 trillion rupees over next one year. This article was also taken from the paper Mint. So in a recently released India rating banking sector outlook, it has suggested that there is a stockpile of about 3.5 trillion bad loans in Indian banks which are still unrecognized. And there is high possibility that nearly 40% of these loans will turn into NPAs, that is non-performing assets, in the coming two financial years. So currently, Indian banking system has about 13% gross NPAs. And the, according to this report, 3.5 trillion of bad loans are still unrecognized. And with the rise in this level of NPAs, this can pose a serious threat to the financial health of Indian banks. The major stressful areas for this N contributing to this NPA include infrastructure and power. According to the official data, the gross NPA of banks is expected to decline from 10.8% in September 2018 to about 10.3% to 10.2% in September 2019. However, taking into consideration this unrecognized assets, this decline may not be theoretically possible. With the increase in this 2 trillion NPA in the next year, this will amplify the already existing capital crunch problem in Indian economy, which will definitely have negative impact on the growth and development of India. The final article for the day is taken from PIB. It talks about the classification of farmers based on the land holdings they have. So Indian farmers are classified based on the land they hold. According to Ministry of Agriculture, a marginal farmer is a person who holds land below 1 hectare, small farmers holds 1 to 2 hectares of land, semi and medium farmers 2 to 4, medium farmers 4 to 10, and large farmers are the ones who hold land more than 10 hectares and above. In the Indian scenario, this marginal and small farmers, they constitute more than 80% of the total farmers in our country. So this becomes very important in the light of new schemes implemented based on the land holdings and the income transfer based on the land holdings. Without proper data on the land holding, the implementation of these schemes with precision becomes impossible. Apart from based on land holdings, the farmers are also classified based on the social groups that is scheduled the caste, scheduled the tribes and others. And classifying the farmers based on both economic land holding as well as social uh, groups becomes very much imperative for the government to promote modern technologies uh, and practices such as multiple cropping, intercropping and integrated farming systems for the poor and vulnerable farmers. Thank you.